Let's ask Mike Flurio, ProFootballTalk.com. Mike, welcome in. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard about Holmgren talking today, and, and he says it's unfair to uh, criticize the team for how they played McCoy. After what, what else the- do we expect him to say? Yeah. I mean, really, I, all due respect to Coach Holmgren, but, yeah, he works for the team. Of course he's going to say that. They're trying to get the heat off of this thing so they can move on. But so he, which, when you saw him on the sideline, they, Colt McCoy was more complaining about his hand. Well, look, I, the last thing that, that anyone should be listening to on that sideline is what the player is saying. It was obvious that Harrison, James Harrison, the Steelers, blew McCoy up. He was laying on the ground. He needed to be checked for a concussion, and he wasn't. And that's the bottom line. And the procedures need to change. I'm not saying that the Browns need to be fined or Pat Shermer needs to be sent to the timeout chair or anything like that. The culture needs to change. The protocol needs to change. There are so many changes the NFL needs to make. They've figured out how to deal with the problem of guys who have been diagnosed with concussions. They now deal with that properly. Guy can't return to practice, can't return to a game in the future until he is cleared by an independent neurologist. That's fine. They need to beef up the procedures during games in the heat of the moment when there's so much going on, there's so much pressure and stress, and guys want to play, the coaches want them to play. They need to find a way to ensure that any player who possibly has suffered a concussion is properly checked out before he goes back into a game. Because McCoy had a concussion, he had no business going back in that game. But, Mike, what if he wasn't showing those symptoms right then and there should they just err it on the side of caution how do we know that though how, well i don't how, i don't know but well, I, that's the thing because here, here, here's what happens whatever curse and 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 I, I apparently holmgren acknowledged today what had been reported over the weekend by espn that that the standard scat 2 concussion protocol wasn't administered to mccoy which makes sense how in the hell else does he get back in after only two plays what they need to do and and i've been saying this for weeks now you have somebody above the field level, somebody in the replay booth or a separate booth, and maybe a team of people looking at the sidelines, looking at the live action, looking at the replays. And if there's anyone who possibly has had a concussion, you flag down to an independent neurologist on each sideline who's responsible for checking that person out. And checking the, And I've talked to neurologists about this. It's one thing to try to check a guy out for a concussion on the sideline of a 65,000-seat stadium with all the hustle and the bustle that goes on while a game is being played, and it could be cold, it could be rainy, it could be windy. you got to take that guy into the locker room. you got to take his shoulder pads off. You sit him down in a comfortable chair. You give him some Gatorade or a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever. Let him get comfortable and check him out. The problem is that's the right way to do it, but you're going to have guys who don't have concussions who get sucked out of action in a key moment of a game, and the coaches are never going to stand for it. But that's the only way to prevent this from happening, where a guy who truly has a concussion ends up back in a game. Because, look, McCoy had a concussion. I don't care when the symptoms showed up. He had a concussion. And when you're out there having just had a concussion, you are at a significantly increased risk of having a serious injury and or dying on the field if you get hit like that again. And James Harrison was still in the game. And if James Harrison would have gotten another shot at Colt McCoy, James Harrison would have taken it. All right, well, let's go on to James Harrison and and the – because it, it was blatant. It was, and I know he was out of the pocket. He was now considered a runner, which is no, kind of no, that gray no, area. No, 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 no. That's that's incorrect. When he's what? out of the pocket, he only loses two protections. Uh-huh. When he's the quarterback out of the pocket, he can be hit low. The Tom Brady rule goes away, and the one step rule goes away. You know, you get mm-hmm. one step before it's roughing the passer. You're still protected when you're a quarterback out of the pocket. You're still protected against being struck in the head or being struck with the crown of the helmet anywhere. So when Colt McCoy throws that ball, James Harrison cannot hit him helmet to helmet, or in this case, helmet to face. You can't do it. And James Harrison doesn't understand that. Well, if James Harrison doesn't understand that, that means his coaching staff is doing an expletive deleted job of, <laughs> of uh, telling their players what the rules are because it's in the rule book. And these guys get paid millions of dollars to coach their players. If, if guys like me can read the rule book, and see what is and what isn't allowed, a guy who's getting paid three, four, five million a year should be expected to do it too. Okay, so why appeal then? Well, because this isn't about whether or not the hit was illegal. This is about whether or not the time has come under the system of progressive discipline that the NFL uses. And most workplaces have something like this. A lot of schools have this. It's, the question is, have we gotten to the point 
based upon the string of prior incidents that we should suspend James Harrison. And he'll say it should be something less than a suspension. You should, you should find me a game check before you suspend me. My next defense should be a suspension. I don't know what the argument's going to be, and actually the hearing was scheduled to start today before Ted Cottrell at 2 p.m. Eastern time. But you, you throw the Hail Mary pass, and you, you see if maybe Ted Cottrell, who was a defensive coordinator and maybe is going to be more sensitive than Art Shell, who was an offensive lineman, is going to be about an issue like this. But, um, you know, you, you take your chance and you hope to be able to play, but the next time you are going to be suspended. And if this suspension is upheld, if he does it again, it's not going to be one game the next time. It's going to be two, or it's going to be three, and then it's going to be four, and then it's going to be eight. And the problem is the guy still doesn't get it. See, Rodney Harrison said last year when we had that rash of helmet-to-helmet hits all in one day, including James Harrison on Browns receiver Mohamed Massaqua, Rodney said, you can find me all you want. I don't care. You suspend me, it gets my attention. Well, that's not the case with James Harrison, so maybe he needs to be suspended more than one game to get his attention. You're on fire today, brother. <laughs> well, these are look. Here, here's the thing, and and you know we all have our own motivations for feeling the way we feel about things. And I'd love to I'd love to say that I'd feel this way about this issue if I didn't have a son who plays high school football. But the fact that I have a son who plays high school football makes me even more sensitive to these cultural issues in the game because I see it play out. I see kids come off the field and they don't quite know where they are. And I see them back in the game. And that's wrong. And it needs to change. And the only way it's going to change is if it changes at the top of the sport and it trickles its way down to the lower levels. Nice. I, I, you know, I'd agree with you, Mike. I think the days are the old uh, I took my tough pill and the macho thing. I mean – we don't need guys walking around with brain damage and later in life. Um, well, now we know. That's the yeah. thing. All those past years we didn't know. Well, now we know the damage it can do, so you have to change behavior accordingly. Hey, off the top of your head, we kind of had a topic today. If you were starting a team and I, I told you every quarterback is available to you, how many picks would it take for you to finally get to Tebow? I'd start with Aaron Rodgers, and then factoring in age of quarterbacks – Tebow would be number two. Are you serious? Yes. Wow. Over Breeze? Yes. Wow. That's big. Because oh, I, a... I know for the next 15 wow. years, I have a guy who is going to motivate everyone around him. Number one, he's going to motivate every player on both sides of the ball to be better than they can be. Number two, he's going to be a magnet for free agents for the next 15 years. When you have guys like Carlos Dansby, the Dolphins linebacker, say that Members of the Dolphins believe that God is working through Tim Tebow. You can get those guys to come sign for your team for less money than it otherwise would take, I believe. So Broncos are going to be a good team, I think, and they're doing it in an unconventional way, and some people think it can't last. But you know what? With each passing week, it keeps happening. And at a certain point, we can't just say this is an incredibly uncanny streak of luck. We have a guy for the same reasons that Tony Romo collapses in the fourth quarter. Tim Tebow gets better in the fourth quarter. And I think it's starting to have an effect on the opponents as well. It, and the example I've been using, it's like trying to beat your older brother in ping pong. No matter what you do, you can't do it. Because at that key moment, when you feel like you can do it, it gets into the back of your head, you're supposed to lose. And I think the opponents of the Broncos are starting to feel like they're supposed to lose because for whatever whatever reason, Tebow's the chosen one. <laughs> So you're I, so his future is in Denver. So they're going to buy in. They'd be Elway crazy the whole thing. not to buy in. Look, only one team wins a Super Bowl every year. One team. So embrace a guy that is beloved in the community. That's going to sell that stadium out. That's going to drive high TV ratings. It's going to sell jerseys like they've never sold jerseys before. And and just because it's different than the way John Elway did it, who cares? I think in hindsight. Maybe Pat Bullen regrets hiring John Elway because John Elway is the last remaining impediment to the franchise and the city and the state fully embracing Tim Tebow. And Elway better get with the program sooner. He's going to be the one who's rendered irrelevant. Mike, well done, buddy. Appreciate talking with you, and we'll uh, check in with you again next week. We'll find out if you're still picking Tebow at number two. All right, we'll see you guys.